we're going to get started. Uh, thank you guys for being here. I know a few of your faces. Um, go this this way. So my name is Paul Gunther. I'm, I guess you would call me the missions pastor here at the Grove. Uh, introduce yourself. Um, lessons uh, from Malawi. I just arrived this uh, this week, actually. So I had a um, uh, ministry back home in Malawi, uh, supported by the Grove. Called? What do you do? What's it called? What's your title? Oh, uh, I'm the country director uh, for the ministry. It's called uh, Live Love Malawi. And so we do uh, community development, but at the center is Christ. You know, so whatever we do flows out of uh, our Christian life. Yeah. Good. So we're going to be going back and forth. It's, uh, if you have questions, raise your hands. Um, one of the things, a little background, is I grew up as a missionary kid uh, in Thailand and Malaysia. My grandfather moved to Thailand, Cambodia in 1926 and then went up into Thailand, was one of the first missionaries in northeast Thailand. I was captured in World War II as a missionary, sent his family back home, and he stayed and was there for about a year or two in, in captivity. And then my dad and my mom moved back when I was a kid to Thailand, and then I went to boarding school in Malaysia. Um, and then I uh, lived in Guatemala with my family before I came here. Before I was in eighth grade, I think I was in 30 or so countries. Um, my dad dragged me illegally into a couple of them, uh, great parenting, but the one moment that will always stick in my mind is we were in uh, going up the Thai border on a boat. We went to Burma at the time, which was a completely closed country, and there was a little village, and hey, my dad said, Let, let's go into Burma, and the guide said no, so my dad gave him $20, and he said, okay. So we go into this little village. I mean, it was just going to visit. And I remember getting out of the boat, and my dad pulled me aside. He said, look, if the police come, I need you to run and jump into the river. And I remember thinking, this is your parental advice. And so I asked him when I was older, I said, do you really tell me to go and jump in the river if the police or the army came? He says, yeah, because the river was the border, and they couldn't do anything to you then. So that was a bit of my upbringing um, my dad's name is Paul Gunther. My grandfather's name was Paul Gunther. I've never wandered from my faith, but I told my dad I would never become a pastor. I would never be a missionary, and he was okay with that. And so for years, I just I worked in the film and music industry and just realized how kind of empty a lot of that is. Uh, and so when I came here 16 years ago, the reason I came here is because our lead pastor, Palmer Chin Chin, grew up in the jungles of Liberia. His parents founded the African Bible Colleges where Blessings went to school in Malawi. Uh, I wanted a place that would allow me to think outside the box and was, was constantly going into all the world and yet doing the same thing right here in our community. So the title that I wrote, um, Mission Trips should change your church, not the country you are serving. So it's obviously a bit of tongue and mouth because hopefully everything we're doing is affecting the church, the global church. But what we found here at the Grove is the more of these trips we went on, the greater it changed our church body. And to the point where uh, before COVID, we took a trip every single year to Malawi, if not two trips. Uh, after the earthquake in Haiti, we did about 30 trips over the next five to 10 years. Um, but constantly going to these places and finding people like blessings and saying blessings what is needed instead of coming in and saying here's what is needed. Um, when I was a kid, uh, when I was living in Bangkok, Thailand, my, my best friend was this Indian kid. His name is Gopu. And I didn't realize until it was probably 25 years that that was that's a weird first name, first of all. But he was this tubby little kid. And every time the missionaries from America came and they would do the altar call, he would, he would raise his hand. Now, this is in the early 80s. Um, and I asked him one day, I said, this is like the 30th time you've become a Christian. Why, why do you keep doing this? He goes, these Americans keep giving me gifts, and I know that if I raise my hand, I'm going to get free stuff. And I remember sitting there as a kid, and it was in a room like this. We were all sitting on the ground. I was leaning against the wall. The missionaries from America were doing their thing, and there was a guy. There was always somebody in the back, and in the back, as the hands went up, they would start counting. A great moment, but it was a, it was a hard moment for me because I realized... This is just a, a statistic. 
when they go back to their churches in America, they're just saying, yeah, 30 people came to know the Lord. Well, I'm sitting here as a sixth grader, my second sixth grade year, realizing, yeah, another story. Uh, this is not genuine. This isn't true change, you know, and that wrecked me. Uh, years and years and years later, when I was here at the Grove, probably 30 years later, I, uh, Palmer Chinchin, our lead pastor, told the exact same story, basically, from when he was in Liberia, and the missionaries would come over, and, and the short-term teams would come over, and they would do the same thing. And so as, as we kind of prayed and looked at what we want to do here at the Grove, we wanted to... Uh, go into a deeper relationship with the countries that we're going to. Um, as an entrepreneur for years, I owned a construction company, and when I moved back to Chandler, Arizona here from Guatemala, I was watching the show Extreme Home Makeover. And I'm watching that show, and everyone was talking about how amazing the show was, about how these people would come, and my brother-in-law's an electrician, and he helped out on one of these houses. But I watched the show, and for years I guess kept thinking there's just something that's off. There's something that's bothering me about this show. And as I started to research, uh, about 40% of the people that were given these homes ended up losing them again. So the problem wasn't the home or what they were living in. The problem was the mentorship, the people they were surrounding themselves with, the lifestyle choices they were making. And there was nobody then, once you gave them this amazing gift, there was nobody then to help them walk down a path where they could hold that home. And it dawned on me, that's what the American church did for years and years and years of going to these places. And, and I'm generalizing. So I know there's been for hundreds of years amazing stories done by people, especially from here in America. Uh, but as a kid, that was my impression. They're coming to these places. They don't understand the stories. They're here for a couple weeks, and then they leave. And so we actually went to the, the city of Chandler. We went to the government, and we, we went and asked them. We said, hey, is there a place right here in Chandler that we could start working with and start walking with, the, the worst of the worst? So they drove us all over Chandler, and they finally brought us to this neighborhood, and they said, this is a in a sense, unreached neighborhood. So we started going through life with them. And at the same time, we started going to Malawi. And I started realizing there's this correlation of how do you go through life with somebody so that it not only changes their life, so that it changes my life as well when I go and serve. So when we started going to Malawi, Blessings and I met in 2008, 9, 8? 2008. And you know when you meet somebody, you realize, yeah, they've got it figured out there he was a um hey he was a student at african bible college um comes from a very remote village i'll let him tell that story in a minute but when i as soon as i met him i realized you know i asked him i said how do you pay for college he says well they need security here at the school so i go to school african bible college in malawi during the day at six o'clock p.m at six p huh yeah at six p.m he does security till six thirty the next morning and then I said then well then what do you do he goes well then I try to sleep for maybe an hour or I then go to my classes the next day I said when do you sleep he goes Saturdays and so here's a guy that's literally putting himself through college uh, but more so knows Malawi a thousand times more than I ever, ever will and I just started looking at it. in every community in every place around the world there's the leaders and there's the people that aren't willing to do that the leader we found downtown Chandler was this lady named Ruth. Uh, she will say heavily involved in the Mexican mafia for years. Very tatted up gang member. Uh, her first husband went away to jail for life uh, for a shooting. Her second husband was murdered on a hit, which is most likely her first husband that sent out the hit. The third husband was a guy that came here illegally from Mexico then went back and came back legally. Uh, her first two sons were jumped into a gang and were gang members till they're probably age 22 or 23. Her second two daughters was the second dad uh, who got murdered, and the third kid, or the, the fifth kid, was from her third husband. But she was so rough and wild that she knew the streets like the back of her hand. She had a come to Jesus moment 
and realized that the way she was living was harming her kids, actually. And so uh, she now knows every police in this town, every elected official, every teacher at every school. We had a kid die the other day at Chandler High School. And then so I just called Ruth. I'm like, Ruth, what happened? She's instantly, she knows everything. She knows her community, the community that I live in downtown now, more than I ever will. So what I've thought about with this statement is mission trips should change your church, not the country you're serving. Absolutely, they should change the country, the community. But if you're not investing in the local leaders and the people that know that and giving them all the power and authority, then you're missing the boat. I'm going to ask him to tell a bit of his story. Uh, the last thing I'll say on this is when we have new people here to the Grove, one of the things that they'll ask me is, I don't know if there's a Sunday that goes by where we don't talk about missions to some degree. Before COVID, when we were going to Malawi so often, I've, I've had probably 10 to 15 people come and ask me, I'm new to the church, I'd like to start attending and become a member, but I've heard it's required to go to Africa before I can become a member. Is that true? I'm like, well, yes and no, not really. But if you understand our heartbeat and our pulse, then that you'll find out who we are when you go on those trips. James, just to point him out, James, Jim Heck is one of our elders here at the Grove, so I have to have full disclosure that everything I'm saying has been audited and approved by, by Jim first. Uh, Blessings, tell a little bit of your story and then why, when you, we started Live Love Malawi, how that affected you. Uh, hello, my name is Blessings. Um, I was born and raised uh, in Malawi. Uh, I grew up in a very remote area. By remote, that means no electricity, no running water, um, no hospital, uh, no nothing. Uh, we should say that, but uh, by the grace of God, uh, here I am. And my story starts as I come to uh, African Bible College, um, <clears throat> where uh, that's where I saw the work of God and uh, just my life turning. Um, and that's where I met uh, I met Paul um, and the people coming from the states going to do missions um, in Malawi. And mostly these days I I don't like to talk about my story because uh, I I know that God has used uh, my story where I grew up to be able to affect or to uh, to impact the people that I'm serving right now. Because when I look at the little kids that have you know, no shoes, no clothes, no what. I look at myself as I was growing up, and I can relate with them, and I can tell them, uh, you know, if I, if God was able to use me to be where I am today, he can also do the same to you. Uh, so uh, having the people come from here and, um, you know, coming to Africa, especially Malawi, uh, at first, uh, uh, Paul said I should, I, should, I should say this, but... Uh, uh, they would bring things, you know, uh, and then a, a really uh, good thing. For example, shoes. Uh, so we have pairs and pairs of shoes uh, that would come. And what that would do is would go and, you know, line up people, give them in the village. Uh, is there a problem? Is there a need? Yes, because people have no shoes. Kids have no shoes. And, you know, when it's sunny and it gets sunny, it's hot right now back home. Uh, the kids have to walk on bare, on bare shoes. But what that did was, because if, if it's just something free, you would give the people, but then at the end of the day when the team has left, then you have two, three people that, are, uh, that will say, we didn't receive shoes. So when we're calling them to come and uh, gather with us to do Bible studies, they'll say, but I never received your shoes. Why should I come to your Bible study? I'm like, where were you when we were giving out the shoes? You know, that's not my problem. But then instead of that being a blessing, it became, uh, you know, a curse. It, because now people are like, oh, you, you have the shoes. You're hiding the shoes. You, you're not giving us the shoes. Um, instead of that being a blessing. Uh, not to say that's bad, because here uh, in the States, it changed the heart of people, because people are giving. And people, you know, they, they know it's going to Africa where it's going to help a kid. But then we needed a proper way of doing that because that's where I think he talks about leadership. How best do you give uh, that type of gift? Uh, for example, people would come, uh, they give a candy to one of the little kids and that's okay, you know, we don't get candy every day. So you're just giving one. But what happens is 
that little one candle will attract a hundred kids. Now that becomes a problem. Like how do you how do we split one candle to a hundred kids? Now it's a fight that erupts. And, and and if we are not careful, then the next time you come, you know, it's the parents coming to us after the team has left. But my kid didn't get anything, so he or she is not coming to your program. It's like, but it's just a candle. Like, who cares, you know? But to them, that's a big deal. So unless you you give time to learn the culture, you give time to invest in the people uh, that you know live and have grown uh, in in the area. I think it makes a huge difference. And what we've seen, I've visited here, and I went to NAU, Northern Arizona University, for my masters in uh, sustainable communities. And when you're talking of sustainability, you look at a lot of things, and leadership is part of it. Uh, you look at the people that you're serving. You look at all the stakeholders around. You can just say, okay, who, who built an orphanage? Okay, you've built an orphanage, but how is it going to sustain itself? Because as we saw with COVID, people stopped, you know, supporting. People stopped going uh, on missions. So you have to look into all those aspects as how do you sustain uh, that, uh, that mission. So we would also talk about even training pastors in different in different areas. You've got to look at how are they going to carry that work you know, to the point where even if you leave, they can be able to, you know, to continue with uh, the, that type of work. And I know many books that have been written, Toxic Charity, When Helping Hurts, hurts. hurts. yeah, When Helping Hurts. Uh, uh, and I think the Bible talks about it as well, that, you know, the poor will always be there. But I think we have to look at the best way of doing that and for me visiting here we have seen a lot of people that you know will talk about my visit to Africa has changed me uh, and I think the mind is like oh we can go and change them which is which is perfect but at, at the same time I think also us as Africans or wherever we go and send our teams you know the, the fact that people from here go and they are like they'll never come back or they'll never support you at all but the moment that, you know, God and just Jesus has touched their life, I think uh, that's a huge win as well. Because it shouldn't just be about the people, uh, you know, where we are sending uh, the teams. It's also about the people that are coming back here. Because most of the people, I think if you have been a uh, missionary, uh, they come back wrecked. I think we, at African Bible College, we've had a lot of missionaries. Some of them that are still struggling up to this version. Because they come back here, life is different because of how, you know, uh, they have lived. So I'll, 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 I would say, you know, it's a, it should be a win-win. Like the church here in America, you know, should be changed because of uh, what's, what's happening. At the same time, uh, us as Africans as well, uh, you know, we, we are changing so many ways. But the best that I've seen work is when we invest in the local people and they're able to carry out um, uh, the work that's been done. And uh, that's where uh, African Bible College, especially where I went, has really done a great job. We have um, graduates all over Africa, and most of them are here too, uh, doing great work. Because uh, the, the founder, Jack Chinchen, uh, father to Pama Chinchen, the, the lead pastor here at Grove, uh, he said, we want to raise leaders that are Christians. And that means even if they go and work in any company, it shouldn't just be in the village, in the community. But anywhere we go, you know, they, they, they have the logo, they say faith in action, um, God in motion, faith in action, God in motion, or God in motion, faith in action. Um, which, which means wherever we go, you know, it was all about, uh, about God. And they said teaching the treasures of God's truth. Because when we have that, we have everything that we uh, we need. Um, and one of the things I also like to say is, uh, you know, we can do everything that we want to do, but if those people do not have Christ, then we're really missing the point. Because um, as Christians, we want to affect that change. But how we affect that change to them is also very important because it should change us. It should because if we just go like we're going to change them. Uh, most of the people, they are the ones that have come back, uh, you know, change. So I, I don't know, if, yeah, unless there's any question. But I think for us, this has really worked, where the people or the local people are being invested in, 
um, they've been able to carry, I think, great work um, in the country um, that they're in. Um, but let me say, I think wherever I've traveled, most people have asked, so uh, short mission trips, good or bad, uh, I think most people have that at the back of their mind. I, I would say, I think the bad part is what, the negative part is what I've said, but uh, for example, African Bible College, they, uh, Dr. Jack Chinchin had to go on a, a short mission trip, and, and what birthed uh, African Bible College, now it's still impacting people all over, but they had to go on a short term mission, and then something happened, and then uh, a few years uh, a few years ago, what has happened also, there was trust that was lost between the, uh, I'm talking as coming from Africa, from Malawi, uh, because what would happen, people would invest, and when they went to see the work, the work was not done. Uh, people were just, you know, putting money in their pocket instead of doing the actual work. So, uh, mission, short mission trips, uh, good, yes, because when people go, they see where their money is going. They go uh, where they, they know that they've invested um, you know, their, their resources so they're able to do that. But also the people that have done great work are the people that have gone on a mission trip and when they come back now they start to support uh, you know, great work that's still happening uh, right there in Africa. So uh, yeah, thank you. So one of the things for, for me, uh, when I first went to Malawi, uh, again, growing up as a missionary kid, being in tons and tons of countries, we had a, a couple of people on our team that everywhere we went, they kept throwing candy out the window. And I kept thinking about them doing that because then they'd throw it out and then there's just people coming, swarming around. And I felt like, okay, it feels like we're at the zoo. And it feels like you're throwing candy and you're feeling really good about yourself. We're in this village... Uh, Behind CO10. Doesn't matter. Maguire. And kids were everywhere. And the lady that had been throwing out the candy was holding the candy. She turned around, and this one little kid was standing there, and she gave the kid the candy. The kids just were smiling and ecstatic. It was a, it was a, the hard candy you chew on. Jolly, Jolly Rancher? Whatever. He opens it up, he goes to take it, and he turns like this, and his mom is standing there. His mom punched him in the face, took the candy, put it in her mouth, and walked away. And I remember standing there thinking, I'm never, I don't ever want to throw and hand out candy ever again. When he asked me to come, I, I asked him, what do you need? He says, bring us candy. <laughs> and I'm like, well, who are you going to give it to? Me? I'm like, okay, blessings, I'll bring you candy. <laughs> and you can decide who to hand it to. But that really was a hard moment for me. When I came back, that was our first trip to Malawi. I asked Palmer as we're talking, I said, if we're going to do this, I want to do it differently. I want to find a village, and we'll go there till the end of the time. End of time. That, that'll be the one place that we're going. Uh, and, and so we started talking to other churches and what they were doing. And the same question they kept asking me is, what's your exit strategy? And I said, what do you mean? They said, what is your exit strategy? How are you going to leave? So I said, what's the exit strategy with your kids? And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, when are you going to be done with them? And they said, well, no, I'll never be done. The relationship's going to change, but we'll never be done. I said, okay, exactly. So if we're going to pour into a community in Malawi and Haiti and Thailand, wherever, that should be generational. That shouldn't be that we here at the Grove do that for three or four years. I'm hoping after I'm long dead and gone, the relationships, and, and he's still alive, the relationships are still continuing. So probably 25, 30 years ago, Palmer and his twin brother Paul went into this little village called Malika. And in that village, they built a church. Uh, the village, just so you can picture it, here's ABC. You go down a road. You go down a road. You go down this road. This is dirt. There's a village right here that actually looks like that. And then there's a road here. As the crow flies, is that the statement, crow flies? It's probably 20 kilometers. Uh, it would take us probably 45 minutes in the very beginning to get from there to here. This, just so you know, is on a main road. ABC is an oasis. It's one of the greatest places I've ever seen in my life. 
this, when we started, was probably equivalent to 1860, the year. I mean, you were going back in time like nobody's business. When we would drive in, the church was right here. The chief's name was Malika. Malika was the only female chief at the t time, correct? She was also the only Christian chief. This was Ken Gondi, who was, you could tell, a very dark human being spiritually. And then right here is uh, Chimpampa. Chimpampa is technically the chief over all three. Malika is the chief only right here. All the Christians lived in this village. That's the reason she became the chief, is because all the Christians wanted to live together. In order to get here, every day, we'd come in from ABC, we'd come in here in the morning, we'd drive right through the middle of the village of Chimpampa, because that was the only way in, and we'd drive over here to Chimpampa, to Lisa, Chimpampa, Malika. But that would be like driving from the worship house to maybe here, maybe a little bit farther. So not, we're not talking a long distance. And yet we would stay here. The second day we go in, third day we go in. By the fourth or fifth time, all the boys are standing right here. And as we're coming in, they're throwing rocks at us. And again, that feeling of this, this isn't working. That went on for probably a couple years. Um, Malika then came to us when we came a couple years later. And she said, we love you coming here. But can you go to this side of the village? I said, what do you mean? She said, you always are coming here. So now the community, to some degree, is against me. Is that the right words? Uh, and it's reflecting bad on my leadership. Can you please come over here? Two or three years in, we've got almost every kid in the village coming to our ministry. We have most of the women coming to our ministry. And we have zero men and boys, nothing. And they would stand there and throw rocks at us every time. And so Blessings and Richard, his partner and I, uh, Richard and Blessings were two students that we met at the same time. I asked them, I'm like, what do we do to get the men in the village? How do, how do we change and pivot and focus differently? And they said, well, we could play soccer. I said, well, what in the world good is that going to do? He goes, if we play soccer, all the men and the boys will come. And I said, yeah, but what does that have to do with Jesus? He goes, we'll do devotions at halftime. And if they want to pay the second half, they got to stay for the devotions. And I said, great. That was on, I think, one of our last days there on our short-term mission trip. When I came back the next year, I've never seen a greater change in a community. Again, I've been in, at this point, 40 different countries all over the world, all kinds of remote places. I've never seen a community change more than I did in that one-year time cycle. And I asked them, I said, what in the world happened to this village? And he said, we played soccer. And it radically changed the entire community. You want to add anything to that before I keep going? Soccer. Okay. Yeah, um, so the men, boys in Africa, they love soccer. And you are find something that is uh, very common in any community that you draw, that you, you know, draw. Uh, the masses to you, so we use that uh, as our entry point, and that's where we would not just play soccer, but also share our faith with the people in that community. Uh, because at first, again, we did the uh, the thing where we just go and start preaching, you know, uh, we, we and what that did to the boys, the moment they saw us coming, they saw the car coming in the community, they would run away. They'll say, oh, they'll come and tell us about our sins, you know, how bad we are. So when we invited them to soccer, because they were forced to stay because they wanted to play. And what we did was to tell our testimonies and what Jesus has done in our lives. And it's changed the village. They are really great. Actually, when I go back this Christmas, you know, there are 16 teams that are competing. Uh, and what that means is we will have 4,000 to 5,000 people that we can stand on the podium and tell them about the good news. So uh, it's really worked perfectly. And one of the things on that, when those I've been there for those tournaments, and he'll say to me, Paul, get up there and preach. And I, every time, no, you preach. And, it, and so we'll argue going back and forth. And I said, blessings. I'm here once or twice a year. You're here two to three times a week. Your interns are here four to five times a week. 
who who are they going to listen to? Me, because I li- look different, so I get that. So there is part of that where he's told me, if you don't stand up there and speak, you're taking away the value of who you are and who we are. You're validating it. The Azungu, the white guy coming over from America. But what we're also doing is validating the person that they see every single day. One of the things that went through my mind is, as an American, as an entrepreneur, as a, a creative person, uh, a guy that likes to, I love, part of my role here at the Grove is I just help start things. As soon as I start, then I get bored and I move on to the next. It's the greatest role in the world. Uh, but what I found is, is going to Malawi, I'll look at the community. I'm like, well, if they did this and I do that and they need this and they need that. And I start processing how to do it. In rea- what I've learned is I'll ask blessings. I'll say, hey, blessings, I think we should do this. And he'll say no. And I said, so then I'll, yeah, but I think it would be really good if we did this same thing. Just look at it from this angle. No, Paul. I'll give it a couple more hours of blessings. I think the same idea. What if we did this? No. And I have to learn to trust him and listen to him. And he'll finally, uh, culturally, when we first met, he wouldn't tell me no. Uh, it's just so, Malawi is the warm heart of Africa. It was a British colony. Very traditional. When you think of um, Stanley Livingston, was his first name Stanley? David. David Livingston. David Livingston was in Malawi, Livingstonia, Lake Malawi, all of those places. That's where the Presbyterian Church of Africa started. So it was this very proper, and I come into the village as this loud American yelling and screaming and blessings. As uh, I called him once, I was like, Blessings! And he walked all over and he just came and stood next to me, in Malawi. We talk quieter. <laughs> and so I had to learn from him on the proper way to be in this village. Um, it, it took a long time. Stand up real quick. So what I tell people now is I teach a class on missions here. At, we have Justice College here. Uh, and in the missions class, I had one of my kids. He's a loud mouth. I said, go stand over there. He thought he was in trouble. I'm like, just stand there. And the entire class, I had him stand up like this and completely ignored him. And so he kept going like this. I'm like, put your hands back up. So he put his hands up. Scotty Towers. So then he'd uh, put his hands down. I'm like, put your hands back up. He put his hands up. And then finally, one of the students in the class said, isn't there a story in the Bible like that? And I said, oh, yeah, there is. What was the story? And so then they had to find it. So what I tell people now is my role, put that hand up. This is my role. And we've, we're still finding somebody over here. But this is my role. And this is what I tell the role of every single person that comes from the Grove. Your role is not stand here. Your role is not even to stand here. Your role is to stand here. And if you're standing here, your role is to do this. And the analogy you can sit down. The analogy is, is I'm holding his arms up. I'm there to give him support. I'm there to give him, I'll use this word loosely, wisdom. Um, I'm there to walk through life with him. But he's the one that makes the greatest impact. If you've been overseas, then you've probably had somebody walk up to you and say, give me a dollar. Have any of you experienced that? Give me one dollar. And it's, it's repetitive. In every country, in every place that you go, give me a dollar. A couple years ago, I was in the absolute middle of nowhere in Liberia, and somebody, this kid came by and said, give me a dollar. I looked at him, I said, you give me one dollar. And he just stood there totally confused. He said, why would I give you a dollar? I said, I don't know. Why would I give you a dollar? And it was kind of a rude conversation. But I use that also in our training for our people that are going over, is there's a place for who we are going to join him. There's a place for who he is going into his community. So when he goes in to Chimpampa, this village, versus when he goes into Malika, this village, one of the things that he does is he'll ask them, who, who are your leaders? So how did you put together, they have what they call committees. And so when we go and ask how can we serve your committee, your, your community, he will establish a committee within that village. Can you explain that? Uh, so, uh, uh, the, as, as And so 
in the way of asking permission to gain their trust, we had to say, can you give us people that we can work with? So that when we bring in something new, so now if we have to bring in shoes, we have a committee or a steering committee that we can go through because they will know the numbers of the people in that community. They will know who has the power and who has not. They will know who are the crazy and who are the good people that we can work with. So that has really helped us by, uh, at first we started with the actual chiefs or the actual leaders uh, and by telling them our vision and why we are in that community. And actually just to add, we were very scared, as you said, most of them come from the darkest place like Juju or Voodoo or Witchcraft. Uh, but what we've done actually every year the teams come. Uh, last This year actually in uh, summer we had 180 or 190 leaders from this community. Not this community, that's that's probably representing 60 to 70 villages. So now because of what was started right here has spread all over, uh, all over this place and we had 100 and a uh, hundred something of those and now we can gladly you know talk to them about Jesus because we've established those committees we've established the trust with uh, uh, with the leaders uh, of those of those places so each year we are doing those conferences uh, to say uh, you know to learn from the greatest leader who is uh, Jesus so one of the things we looked at is how do we as a church work together? So when we were asked to start, or when we started asking about serving downtown Chandler, I went to a bunch of other churches and I said, hey, there's this community. What if we work together in this community? I'm from the Grove. And every single time it was like, no, we have our own ministry. And then I'd go to the next one, no, we have our own thing we're doing. And I couldn't get a single church to partner with us. Uh, when we started looking at Malawi, I, I look at, so what we do is called long-term community development. It's also called slow evangelism. Uh, evangelism explosion is something that's taught in Malawi. Don't see, there's nothing wrong with it. It's basically going door to door, knocking on people's door. Do you know Jesus as your savior? If not, let me tell you why. Our motto was, let's go play soccer. Let's hang out. Let's earn the right to be heard. And it takes a long time. Uh, with most nonprofits, so we have a non-religious nonprofit here in America. Live Love Malawi is a religious nonprofit in Malawi. I also have my Grove hat on. When you look at any nonprofit, they'll all oftentimes say, "We gave away 15,000 books. We signed up 12,000 students. All very good things." Our first three or four years, well, we played a lot of soccer. We ate it downtown. We ate a lot of tamales. It was wasn't quantifiable, and it was almost it almost felt defeating. Like it was like this isn't working because we don't have any proof. That we're literally just sitting and being with people. And so in this village, like I said, for two years these guys sat in this village, and then finally realized, no, we need to start sitting in this village. Well, then for probably the next five or six years, we only sat in this village. And finally, Malika got mad at us and said, you never come back to our village anymore. And we're like, well, you told us to go over there. And so looking at those personal dynamics, where'd that mark go? So as we started looking at that, as you, as you go down, it's actually that way. There's a village called Chaliza. Chaliza, he's 185 years old. He's the oldest man I've ever met in my life. I don't know how old he really is, 80? When I met him 10 years ago, he looked ancient. And hes he offers me a wife every time I'm there. Uh, he's the happiest guy I've ever met in my life. He's over probably what? Probably this, right? Uh, over here is a village called Makanda. Uh, what we started realizing is the Grove Church has gone deep in this community. We have a church in Hollywood that is going deep in this neighborhood or that village. We have... Huntington Beach kind of that is done in this community and what we started looking at look there's another guy that's down here there's villages all over the place that are completely remote and as if we as churches kind of partnered in a sense trusted he has 40 some interns that are going into these villages every single week and we've realized if you go into this village and you have somebody that is sitting with the chief every week which is something that he's very good at and listening and just being there with them. Then you have somebody else that is sitting with, first of all, the widows, and then secondly, the women in the community. Another person that is sitting with the kids, and another person that's playing sports. 
over and over and over again. So then what happens is we at the Grove, when we're there, we are in this village every single day for two weeks, over and over and over again. And I tell them, here's the things we're working on. I would I care less if you finish your project. If you're on the construction team, I hope you don't get it done. If you're on the widows team, I hope you don't finish a lot of that stuff. Because they're the ones that need to finish these things. We're just here to establish relationships. And what I've seen then over the years is as our people come and go back and go back, our retention rate of our people going back overseas to Malawi every year has grown. When COVID hit, and nobody can travel anywhere, and ministries are shutting down all over the place. I brought Palmer Chin Chin with us and one of our other elders to Malawi, and when I walked into his village, the amount of change and things that he's done was mind-boggling. He put in, he put it, he's like, I'm putting in a barber shop. I'm like, a barber shop? That's the dumbest idea in the world. He also told me he's opening up a restaurant. I'm like, a restaurant? Nobody's gonna go to a restaurant in the middle And they're thriving. He knows it way better than I do. And what happened is, is when we found our place to hold up his arms, to trust his wisdom, to find the best of the best, and to allow him to find the interns to go in and in and in and in and in, when we're finally there, it's this amazing experience. That kid that asked for a dollar, Blessings and I tell this story everywhere we go. Uh, name something that an unreached community needs to survive outside of Jesus. Water. water. Not just water, but clean water, right? Okay. Food. Okay. Work. Work. Shelter. Shelter. What else? Security? What? Sorry, what did you say? Elec- I'm not going to say electricity because I technically don't need it. Light helps. Studies have shown if families, kids have light, they get more homework done. Healthcare? Okay, what else? Did we get everything? I need these things to thrive, to survive. You didn't put education down there. And to be honest, education. Tools. Tools, meaning what? So that's an interesting one, because I brought farmers over with me. Uh, Malika, her farm is so far over here, and I asked her, what do you need to farm? And she's like, I don't need anything. I'm like, well, yeah, but you're using a shovel. She goes, yeah. Our people have been doing that for a thousand years, and it's working great. And so we invented, not invented, we helped them come up with a pedal thing that would pump the water, and it was this great invention, and they stopped using it because it's like, it's, it's not how we do it. We don't need it. And so there's that fine line of do they need it? Do they want it? Do I want them to have it? That's where the communities, these commu- these committees are so important. These are all necessary things, and I think we have nonprofits that will come in and partner with us in this village. Our passion at the Grove is right here. We're meeting these things. We're helping them partner. We're not doing it for them. We're, we're, we're working through one of the things they said after a year or two, we don't have clean water. So we raised the money, I think it was in three days. We dug a well before we left, but that was because of the committee and the chiefs and blessings said it was okay. We're waiting to get on the plane, we're almost late to leave, they're still digging, all of a sudden water comes shooting up, we all cheered, took a picture and went and got on the plane. There's other uh, wells in that community that had all gone bad because they were done by nonprofits that didn't know the community, they came in, they dug a well and then they left and never went back. Well, what happened is, is the neighboring tribe came over, stole all the parts, went into the city, and sold them. The difference is, is Malika said, I need this well right here in this exact spot. Chimpampa said, I need a well right here exactly in that spot. They've been there for how many years? 
10, 10 years, never had a problem because they had ownership. As I started looking at this, though, I realized if you were to look back on your life and somebody tell me in 30 seconds a story from your childhood that's fun, a good memory. Anybody? My father told us not to play with fireworks, so we thought it'd be fun to go under the bed and light, light him. <laughs> and we set the bed on fire and ran out of the shower naked and had to drag the mattress up. <laughs> there you go. See, that's a great story. <laughs> what else? My parents set up this scheme with my neighbor, my school neighbor, to convince me that Santa Claus is on the roof. Got me my signal. And you've probably told that story, both these stories, your whole lives, right? As I started, as we started looking at this community, uh, if you're familiar with the Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram 7, which means fun is really important in my life. Uh, but when I look at the word fun, or stories, or memories, they have a saying in Africa, uh, in Malawi. Malawi is the third poorest country in the world. And they say, death is a neighbor to us. Meaning, it's so common, it just happens all the time. Growing up overseas, I've seen a lot of horrific deaths. I counted once, and I was up to like 65, uh, like witnessing people being killed. And that does something to your mind. If death is a neighbor, then that means it's just common. Uh, when I started asking about memories... They were, oh, we ran out of food this year. Or I remember I got malaria and I almost died. And there wasn't a lot of fun. There wasn't a lot of good memories. And there wasn't a lot of good stories. And so then we started realizing there's a huge difference between surviving and thriving. Uh, his story, like he, he watered it down a little bit. Elephants and lions going through his village. His grandmother's friend got eaten by a lion. He got his true story. He got his first pair of shoes when he was 10. They were red. I mean, he lived so remote in the bush, and yet somehow he had the tenacity to make it. He's, is there anybody else in your village that made it? Made it? Out of how many were in your village? A thousand? Yeah. Yeah. You're not talking about a very high success rate. Chimpampa, when we first started working, I didn't realize this. He said it was the exact same thing in his village. We have a girl now that's in medical school that started up in our kids' program 12 years ago. Uh, success story after success story after success story. Because we started realizing how important fun was and how important stories and memories uh, our big soccer tournament. The winning team was our village. We won one year. In way over here, that would be our equivalent of driving to ASU's football stadium. These guys had never been. There's a new soccer stadium that the Chinese built, which is a whole different thing. The Chinese will come in, build a soccer stadium, put in a road, and trade for minerals. They'll take all the minerals, and then they leave. So the Chinese came in and built this massive seats. 45,000? Uh, and it's always empty. So the soccer tournament, Chaliza wins the, Chimpapa wins the soccer tournament. We bring out a bunch of buses. I tell the soccer team, get on the bus. So they get on the bus. I said, do you know where you're going? And they said, no. I said, okay, good. So blessings and myself and a few of our leaders get them in. We're driving them up. They've never even been here, a lot of them. We're coming up right here. There's this hill. And that when you get to the top of the hill, you can see the soccer stadium. They're in their soccer gear, right? Yeah. They have no idea where they're going. As soon as we're at the top of the hill, I said, have you guys ever seen that before? And they said, no. And I said, it's a soccer stadium. I said, how would you guys like to go play there? And they start screaming and yelling. We pull in. We paid. I, sorry, not sorry. I gave the security guard 20 bucks, and he let us in for one hour. And the soccer team went in there and played a soccer game for one hour. Uh, and it was, I mean, they talk about that still, right? 
So it was one of the greatest days in their lives. It cost me 20 bucks. It was the memory realizing, you know, and you're constantly buying in at this deeper level. So that circle was great, but when that kid asked me for a dollar, somebody before had driven by on, their, on a bike. And so if you picture this as a bike tire, I asked the guy, I said, Who's, whose bike was that? This is in Liberia. I said, whose bike is that? And they said, oh, that's so-and-so. I'm like, how do you know? And he says, I can tell on the tread. I said, so who do you think has a bigger impact in your community, him or me? He goes, you. I said, why? He goes, you're white and you're rich. And I said, okay, but you may never see me again. I said, who's here more often? He goes, that guy. I said, so you're still saying that I have a greater impact of changing this village than he does? And he sat there for a while and he goes, well, no, he probably does because he's here all the time. I said, exactly. And so what I tell our people is when you're going on a mission trip with us, understand that the tread is the people in the village. And they're the ones making the greatest impact. These spokes are all very important. For us, they all lead to Jesus. So we built a hospital. It was a small clinic. He then turned it into a full-time clinic. Last year, you were hoping to see how many patients? 50. And how many did you see? 8,500. <laughs> so he comes to me and says, I think we can see 50 people. I said, great. Figure it out. The community then says, no, this is desperately needed. And the reason why is we had a lady that was a widow. They said, come see this widow. What time is it? Uh, we think she's sick. And so Malika brings us to the widow. I'm picturing a widow. And when I got there, it was she was probably 30. One of the most beautiful ladies I've ever seen. She was sitting there with her wrap around her legs perfectly straight. She had three kids? Two kids. Okay. And I'm like, that's, that can't be the widow. And I said, yeah, that's the widow. I was with my doctor friend. And we roll her over, and she went to the hospital, and she, had, she didn't have the $5 to pay. So she came back and sat on the step for like a month, right? And each one of her butt cheeks basically rotted. And when I saw her, I could see her, I could literally see her hip bones. And every day, she asked us to clean her, she'd clean her, she'd scream and yell, and the next day, she asked the same thing. Uh, two days, three days later, she died. And he's been helped raising her kids ever since. She died because she didn't have health care. And so we sat and talked and said, we need, that, that, that can't happen again. But that happened because of how deep of a relationship we have with the people in the community. So I tell my people all the time, you're the air nozzle. That's the only thing you are when you're going on these trips. And that air nozzle, let's be honest, when it spins around, it only hits the ground once a year maybe. And I'm going to be in this village every year. You may be here every five years, or you may never come back. So everything that you do is going to make an impact on everything that's happening. And I ask him sometimes, I'm like, is this even needed? He goes, oh, yeah, we, we desperately need you to come, because what do you do with an air nozzle? You put air in it, and that keeps it full. And so when we come, I look at my job more of being with him than I do with being in the village and, and being with the leaders, but also understanding all of these things. All the change comes because of his team. And my job is to hold his arms up. And so what we've seen now is we're asking other churches to come to Malawi and to come take partner with the village and long term go back and go back and go back and go back and trust and hold his arms up. Uh, it's been a beautiful relationship. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done, but I would encourage you, Live Love Malawi. Is that the website? Live Love Malawi dot com dot org? Okay. Live Love Malawi, Blessings Chibambo. Um, do you have any questions before we go? It's almost, we have about a couple minutes, but any questions or thoughts? Nothing? The blessings, you did your job. You did a good job, no questions. Any questions at all? Okay. Uh, we'd love for you to join us, Blessings. Could you pray for us real quick? Father, thank you for the work that you've given us to our us in Matthew uh, 28 uh, that all authority has been given unto you that we should go and make disciples but thank you for your faithfulness that each and every time you teach us and that Lord you continue to pour your spirit upon our lives that we can do the right thing in the right way so thank you for bringing all of us together and as we continue 
with this conference. Lord, may you just show yourself unto our light. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.